welcome to another episode of Board Game Breakfast. Now, last week our live show, the Q&A, did not work very well. I did it at night. We're going to try it again today. We're going to do it at noon Eastern time. Uh, so it's going to not be just, it's going to be me, Sam, and Z. I am looking into some other things for live streaming. This one will still be on YouTube, but we're going to be testing some other live streaming this week to see if that works. So there's lots of things coming up. Once we get into live streaming, we'll get back to playing games live for you guys, and hopefully we'll do well there. Don't forget, this is the last week to enter our contest for Board Game Breakfast. All you have to do to enter this contest to win a $50 Cool Stuff gift certificate and possibly a $500 one is to email us at dicetower at gmail.com and put the word breakfast in your subject line. Spelled correctly, hopefully. And you can enter more than once if you do, you're out, so don't enter it multiple times. And then we'll pick a winner very soon. Okay, so that's all of what's going on with the Dice Tower. We had a lot of videos go up last week. We have more coming up this week. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's get to the news. So there really isn't a lot of news this week, but the biggest news was that a Finnish board game company, whose name I can't pronounce, is publishing, it looks like it's coming out of Essen, Mule, M-U-L-E. Wow, this is a video game or a computer game from the early 80s that got a lot of buzz, a lot of people like it. Some games like Planet Steam and stuff people say are based on this game. This one is definitely based on the computer game, so that will have a lot of people interested. Other than that, a lot of games that people have been looking forward to came out last week. Cthulhu Realms, Firefly Shiny Dice, uh, expansion for Suburbia 5 Star, the expansion for Machi Koro, the expansions for Heroes of Normandy. A lot of different games came out. So recently, I helped a friend move. Now, she is a consummate gamer. And I think she has about 200 different board games that we appreciated and bought stuff on our way out of the apartment. And as many as 15 of those games are non-zombie related. Okay, so I joke, obviously, but I'm not the first one on this channel to do so when it comes to the proliferation of zombie games. Board Game Geek lists over 700 products in the zombie category. 700! By contrast, there are only 240 games listed in the Star Wars category. And a lot of those are mass market games like Risk or Monopoly, and a lot of those are individual ships from X-Wing. So zombies are very popular right now, not just in board games, but in the broader popular culture. And a lot of people say it's our way of dealing with a sense of a, a lost American dream or whatever. I mean, Walking Dead is all about like the collapse of middle America. But I think as far as both pop culture and board games, and specifically, it's something a little different. I think zombies are so popular right now because of political correctness. See, there is no zombie lobby, and there are no undead rights activists, and you don't need to worry about your product successfully penetrating the zombie market. On the other hand, if the bad guys in your game belong to a specific ethnicity or nationality, well, you don't want to worry about offending them. I mean, if you have a game about terrorism and Middle Easterners are the bad guys that can offend people, if you have a game in World War II and Germans are the bad guys that can offend people, if you have a Cowboys and Indians game and the Indians are the bad guys that can offend people, so it could be difficult. However, let me offer some alternatives to zombies that fit the same category and are politically correct. How about robots, or dragons, or aliens, or merpeople, or moon people, or earth elementals, or time-traveling pirates? All of these fit that same role of a generic villain that won't offend anyone, but they'd add a little bit more flavor to our gaming tables. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Robert writes us and says that he has some problems in his gaming group because he's the guy who reads the rules, learns the rules, brings the game to the table, teaches the game to everybody, and then at some point someone will say, oh, I, you can't do that, or I want to do this, and he says, you can't do that. And so they accuse him of winning because he knows the rules better than everyone else. And he calls this the rules knowledge backlash. Um... What to do? In our group, the person who reads the rules doesn't win as much as I do, so I don't think that that's true, Robert. <laughs> okay, so well, when you're not when you're not there, or I've I've had this happen before, where people they just assume I'm the one who learns the game. So if they have to attack someone, I often have, and this just happened on Tuesday. The, we were playing a four player game, and the lady had to attack someone, and she said, "Well." You're the one who taught the games. I'm attacking you. Yes. Okay. Life yes. goes on. That's just how that works. That actually doesn't bother me. 
if there's complaints about it, serious complaints about it, I think the solution's pretty simple. Hand them the rule book. Yes. Um, we do that all the time. Um, in fact, in that game that we were playing, after she attacked Tom, then they realized I was doing well and they decided to attack me. <laughs> but um, usually if we're playing a game, Tom will read the rules first and he will go through them, explain them. And then I'll usually say, hey, Tom, can I look at the rule book? And I'll look something up just in case I was confused about something that he explained. And it's good for someone who was only taught the rules to be able to browse the rule book, look at the different things, and figure it out on your own. And also, I mean, we do this all the time. I always am very clear with people, the first time we're playing a game, I always say it's an asterisk game. Because you might not know the rules. Or the person reading the rules will say, oh, um, I forgot to mention this. Or whatever. Everyone's <laughs> learning. So if you're getting upset that you're not winning that first initial game, I don't understand that. It's just a learning game. It's just the first game. Who cares who wins? Yes, because basically, you know, you want to see if you like the game enough to want to play it again. Because that, that's why we play these games, to figure out which games we like and which games we want to play again and again and again. And... I always say winning isn't the most important thing. It's more important to have a good experience and have fun and play than to worry about winning. So, you know, keep reading those rules. Keep teaching your group. If your group doesn't like it or if they want to read the rules, maybe tell, that, tell one of the other guys, hey, do you want to read the rules and, train, and teach this game? And you see how quickly they'll say, no, 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 you read the in, rules. In a non-snarky way, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or maybe you can send people videos beforehand and say, here's a video of how to play the game. Oh, there's a lot of videos available online. And if they don't watch it, that's on them. Right? Yep. Alrighty. Well, anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. And you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Send us questions at dicetower at gmail.com. <laughs>of reviews coming from the Dice Tower this week. We have One Night Revolution, the expansion to Cash and Guns, WWE, RYU, Ashes, WWE Showdown, uh, Monster Factory. Uh, we'll also be taking a look at the new Dice game uh, for that was from Lewis and Clark. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that's coming up. Uh, I'm really excited about a lot of the different games. I have lots of reviews from the other reviewers too, and Sam and Z will be doing stuff. So we're gonna do that, but there's also gonna be some other videos that you'll see this week, some top 10 lists. We'll be doing a top 10, our top 10 Kickstarter games, and then we'll be doing one of our pop culture ones, our top 10 favorite TV shows, and you never know what else you might see this week, so stay tuned. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, continuing a thought that I started last episode. You, you see, the more that I forced my friends and family to repeatedly watch and rewatch my previous segment, the more I started pondering its list of things about board games, other than the gameplay itself, that there is available to enjoy. There's, of course, the enjoyment of the gameplay, competition, and puzzle solving, and not to mention the social interaction, artwork, components, and even the collectability aspect. Well, as the proud owner of a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, which I absolutely do put to use each and every single day of my life, thank you very much for asking, Mother, my ponderings naturally turned next to artwork. Now, I'm a big fan of artwork that emphasizes line work and color, a style traditionally seen in comic books. Some of my favorite comic artists include Joe Maggiera, especially his nine issues of Battle Chasers, a series that ended way too soon, Gary Frank's run on The Incredible Hulk, Keith Giffen's work on Justice League, and Brian Bolland, whose Joker, in my opinion, is the definitive model for that character. But interpretations of this style are found outside the world of comics, too popularized by pop artist Roy Lichtenstein in the 1960s, and still present in the work of the late, amazingly talented Quentin Hoover. As for board games, the artist whose style I think most closely can be put into this camp, and coincidentally my favorite board game artist, is Josh Capel, whose artwork has adorned many different titles, including Belfort, Scoville, Kings of Air and Steam, Martian Dice, Wasabi, Nornberg, Skyline 3000, and Pirates vs. Dinosaurs. Now, while I will admit that 
pretty much every single comic book that I've purchased since 1986 was primarily just for its artwork. I've never purchased a board game based solely on the same reason. But it's certainly been a determining factor. Case in point would be Garden Dice. I was on the fence about it, but I'm glad that I allowed Josh's artwork to be the factor that persuaded me to get this underrated little tile placement game. So how about you? How influential is a game's artist in your decision to buy? Have you ever purchased a board game based solely on its artwork? In the comments below, let me know not only if you have, but who your favorite board game artists are too. I reviewed three games last week. First one was Lost Cities The Board Game. Now Lost Cities The Card Game is one of my absolute favorite filler two-player games. The board game goes up to four players, added some cool mechanisms, sounds great, right? Unfortunately, they somehow stripped all the tension out of that game that makes the card game what it is. So with the cool mechanisms, great. Uh, stripping the tension out was enough for it to fall really flat for me and I did not like it because of that. Unfortunately, very disappointed. Discoveries, wow, a sequel to Lewis and Clark. It's a dice game, big Gen Con release. It's all about efficiency, rolling dice, you know, uh, comboing cards and stealing other people's dice and using it until at the last minute they steal it back. Some really interesting mechanisms, awesome theme, awesome artwork. For me, I liked it a lot. It's still a little too Euro for me where it's all about efficiency, but I think a lot of people are gonna really love this game. Last is the expansion for Five Tribes, the Artisans of the Nakala. Five Tribes was my game of the year last year. It was in my top 10 of all time. I didn't even think it ever needed an expansion. But this game just, it opened the game up even more and I love it. More tiles, more puzzles, a six tribe, special abilities that allow you to break the rules of the game that just go crazy. I love those special abilities, really makes it. Gosh, this game is even better with the expansion. If you like Five Tribes, no brainer, you gotta get it. If you don't like Five Tribes, I've heard the people that were on the fence with it now even like it a lot with this expansion. That's what I did last week. Hey folks, Z Garcia here. And last week I did four reviews, and it was a good week too, because just about everything got a positive review from me. First up, Bin Fa. Bin Fa is a dice chucker from the 70s originally, in which you're trying to surround your opponents and win. Uh, I, I enjoy it. It holds up, I think, fairly well, but it sure feels like an old game, and that's all right. It's got cool tactics. Next up, Panda Head. Panda Head is a trick-taking game in which uh, you're trying to not win the last trick. Very simple, real straightforward. I don't really like the look of the game, but the game play itself is, is neat and solid. Next up, Vampire Raider. Now, this one I really like. This floored me because it's got great hidden movement. Vampire moves on the board secretly, but it's real clean design, really simple. But man, tension. I love it. And lastly, Snow Tails. Reprint of Snow Tails. This was already one of my favorite racing games anyway, and this reprint really did it well. The quality stayed amazing. Good, good job on this one. So Snowtail, big, big thumbs up. And that was it for me last week. See ya. And for me, from worst to best, we have Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader, which is was a really kind of lame, badly produced, trying to cash in on the resurgence of that show. Not good at all. Small City, which is actually quite a big box about building a city, but just way too heavy and too many restrictions to put out buildings for me to the point where the game felt like work rather than fun. Pocket Imperium, which is kind of trying to take the 4X genre, uh, going out and exploring, expanding, exploiting, and exterminating other players, and putting it into a small abstract game, took out pretty much everything, and it's just abstract. It wasn't very interesting. Face Chase was uh, a speed game of trying to match cards. Ooh, this nose matches that nose, this hair matches that hair. An interesting game. Uh, if you like speed games, you'll like it. Maze Racers, this is kind of cool where you take magnet uh, walls and put them down and you make a maze. And then the other person's doing the same thing. You switch sides and then you take a ball and you try to roll it through the maze that your opponent made for you. A lot of fun and pretty educational. Go Nuts, which is kind of a small dice game, can be used to teach kids a little bit about how pressing your luck works. And there's also the idea that you're involved even when you're not the one rolling the dice. Survive Space Attack. This is a space 
theme version of the Survive game. The angle scenes changed some things. You can now blow monsters up with guns and fighters. And it's also a space theme rather than the Atlantis sinking theme. You don't need both Survives, but if you don't have either and you love the space one, this is a good, really cool game, very, very uh, in your face. Wrath of Dragons uh, sounds like this big, nasty game, but it's actually a Euro game with worker placement and really interesting card play as you try to have your dragons amass the biggest hoard of gold and nobles and wheat and so on. Mysterium. This is one we did on Miami Dice. I thought it was a good game, although I was surprised at the hype it's got. I thought it was interesting. Uh, to see what the other two guys said, go check out the review. Mission Red Planet. Now, this one I loved. I love the original one. This is the Fantasy Flight reprint. I really enjoyed it. So did the other guys in Miami Dice. I actually kept this game, and the game that I kicked out to keep it was Royals, although that's a cheat because I'm, you know, Dice Tower Essentials is going to be reprinting Royals very soon, and I went at, so I, I know I'm getting a better copy of it eventually. Tumbling Dice. The new version of Tumbling Dice is much easier to carry around. It all fits in one box. Tumbling Dice is a great game, so I kept it and replaced my old Tumbling Dice. Mafia de Cuba. This one is a cool game where you have a box, a cigar box, and you're, and you're pulling items out, and then the one person is trying to guess what items everyone pulled off, and they're lying or telling the truth. Very fascinating werewolf-style type game. Really enjoyed it. Kept that one. Got rid of a small card game to take its place called Double Agent, which is a really cool two-player uh, spy type game. Just don't play it that often these days. All right, that's that. Hey, gamers. Welcome back to the bakery. My name is Doug, the board game baker, and today we're going to give away free victory points. So how do I win? That's one of the first things players want to know when learning a new game, and one of the more difficult questions a game designer must answer. Uh, you can have all different ways of scoring a game. Uh, let's talk about public scoring, where everyone is, sees the open score, and then that allows players to kind of see who's in the lead and pull them back in. But it also has the detriment of someone's too far ahead, you may just kind of give up on the game. Uh, another way is to do private scoring, and, know, and everyone feels like they're in the game until the end, but you still may not uh, you know, be able to self-balance within the game. Uh, you can have a mixture of both, uh, which out, works out pretty well, where there's a a public part of the score and then there's some private bonuses that happen at the end. Uh, that, that tends to work well and kind of keeps people involved and then allows you to have that aha moment at the end where you, where you slap down your bonus and, and jump ahead uh, for the victory. Uh, some of the other things you needed to consider is do you want the scores to count up uh, or do you want the scores to count down and is that thematically appropriate for your game. And lastly, you can even have no scoring at all. There's some good games that do that. Money is the root of all evil and is certainly the root of all evil in our factory prototype. Each player is going to start out with a set of funds and they're going to try to grow those funds throughout the game. Uh, this is pretty straightforward and simple, but there is some uh, interesting aspects to it in terms of people can use that money during the game to build more factories, uh, get more resources, and hopefully get more money at the end. So during the game they have to make some hard choices about spending uh, what amounts to victory points uh, for the hope to get more victory points by the end. And I think that, that kind of decision makes, uh, makes the game a little bit more interesting. All right, that's it for this episode. If you get a chance, check me out on these. Uh, remember, that's Board Game Baker without any spaces, and uh, I'll catch you later. You know what's annoying? It's boxes that are full of air. Wow. Someone was showing me the new expansion for Machi Koro, which is really a box that's the size of a brick, essentially. It's this big, and it comes with a pack of cards. Now, I understand that you need to have shelf presence for your games. That's perfectly acceptable. I understand that boxes can't be just, you know, tuck boxes because they get lost in the shelf. So making your box bigger is fine by me. I understand that. But when you make them so big and continuously big, especially when they're expansions, the original Machi Koro box is way bigger than the game needed to be, and each expansion is that big, that just seems very wasteful. I mean, especially for those people, fortunately I'm not one of them, who keep expansion boxes. I feel bad for you. Uh, for me, I, you know, we can put all that in the original one, but just, ah, don't sell me air, please. Welcome to Building Blocks with the Dukes of Dice. Let's say you want to teach a non-gamer a game like Five Tribes or Istanbul. Both of these medium weight games require you to cleverly move pieces around the board to activate different action spaces. 
In Istanbul, each player has their own merchants and assistants that they will move around the bazaar, while in Five Tribes, players share various meeples that they'll lead throughout the desert. The problem with both of these games, for a non-gamer, is that teaching action selection by itself can be daunting, but adding in a spatial component might be too much for some. These games introduce concepts like excluding others from certain actions and prioritizing action selection. To ease a non-gamer into what we'll call spatial action selection, we recommend Longhorned. In Longhorn, players are cattle rustlers trying to raid the most valuable cattle. The first player will choose a location to place his outlaw token. There, you'll collect all of the cattle of a color of your choice. Next, you'll move the outlaw token a number of spaces equal to the number of cattle you raided. You'll flip over the token, and then the next player will take their turn doing the same. If you've taken the last cattle in a location, you will also take the available action token before moving. Some of these are helpful. They might be worth money at the end of the game. Others can be harmful, including the sheriff, who makes you lose outright. For each of their cattle, a player will earn $100 per cattle of that color still on the board, plus any gold nuggets they manage to collect. The player with the most money is the winner. Longhorn is a short 15 to 20 minute experience that can help a non-gamer learn how to maximize spatial action selection while demonstrating the importance of not setting up other players for strong turns. They'll learn the balancing act of playing towards their strategy while being aware of what others are trying to accomplish and actively trying to stop them. With a couple of games of Longhorn under their belt, a non-gamer should be ready to try the more advanced games like Istanbul and Five Tribes. So here we're taking a look at some dice. This is a Kickstarter project called Level Up Dice. And what these are is they're simply six-sided dice that come with this project, but they change the ones and sixes to be more thematic. Like you can see here, this is a five, the big bullet's a six, two, three, and five. So you could use this in games like uh, Bang or, or any game that has any kind of bullets being thrown around where you need to roll three sixes. This one is Buildings. You can see there's different types of buildings. This is one you could use maybe in Machi Koro. This one here with the medic symbol you can use in any game where you need life. Um, Shadows over Camelot perhaps, although the, the cross doesn't really go so well there. Or maybe the pandemic for the disease cubes. The only thing I don't like about this one is they have the, the one side has nothing. So it's two, one, that just kind of annoys me um, OCD wise. I do like the zombie one a lot. Shows groups of zombies. And then there's this one here, the samurai one. And then this one here basically is kind of a pandemic type thing or any kind of game where you need to roll numbers. I would use these for dead of winter. Uh, again, this one's kind of annoying because there's no one on that one side. But these are ones I like a lot, and I think these are fine. There's only a couple problems with them. One is that the sides themselves might not always be quick to figure out what it is. Like, oh, that's a four, that's a five, that's a six. You know, that might take some getting used to. And secondly, they really aren't that inexpensive. They're kind of pricey for the different ones, and half of them aren't even unlocked and so on. But if you really want to make your games look great and be very thematic, this might be something you're interested in. These are Level Up Dice. Okay, you ready? You're filming? Greetings from Gen Con. This is Berkey from the Berkey and Badger Show and Board Game Theater. We've been at Gen Con. We dressed up in costume for Arcane Wonders as the Sheriff of Nottingham with my daughter Maddie as the Silk Merchant. Had a great time interacting with all the, the crowd and all the different people here. It's been so great to meet so many of you. Today we're going to get a chance to actually take a look at some games. We've been so busy doing so many different things, but now we're going to get to the place where we actually get to play games. We're so so excited. I'm with Josiah Burkhardsmeyer, better known as Bob Boxbart from Board Game Theater. He's been playing the game Oitana by Arcane Wonders. And Josiah, I'd like to get your uh, view of what you think about this game. Yeah, well, it's it's a really great game. It's it's really short. It's a two-player strategy game. It's almost kind of like a, a chess or checkers feel. But what really makes it cool is it has these different movement cards that you always, you have two of them available to you, and you always know what you're opponent has and when you move you'll play one of your cards and move a piece and then take the one in the middle and so you're shifting these action cards back and forth trying to either take your opponent's main piece or get your main piece to their zone and it's fairly short but there's a lot of strategy in a little game like this and there's all these extra movement cards that you'll shuffle up each game so that you're not using the same ones every game. So it seems like it would have a lot of variability and it's just really fun. But it's interesting, these aliens 
like to interact with humans. See, look at him. He's beckoning humans to come unto him. He, uh, young humans as well. He must really, maybe they're a kinder and gentler alien. Last week's board game breakfast thing lit off a bit of a firestorm with people taking exception to Vassal's Law, which again is not really a law per se, just something that I really do believe in. But one of the biggest arguments that some people made on the internet was about my definition of great. And so I thought I would talk about that a little bit because I think there is something to be said about this. And I think many of the people or all the people who were had a problem with my definition will not be convinced by the time this is over. Some of them I talked to in real life or through Twitter, but I thought I would explain it. See, everyone has their own opinion of great. And I understand that, right? You know, you can think a game is fantastically great but no one else does, and that's fine. Love the game, who cares what anyone else thinks anyway? But I think when we take a look at, when I say great games will be reprinted, I'm taking great as looking across everything. Now, popularity has something to do with that. Now, whenever I say that, people's hackles rise up, right? You can't say popularity equals quality. That's true, I'm not. And the, def the, 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 the what people say is, well, think about McDonald's. Does McDonald's make the best hamburgers? They do not. And yet, more people buy McDonald's hamburgers than anywhere else. So therefore, popularity does not mean something's good. I understand that. But the difference between that and what I'm saying is, if you go to the person on the street and say, who makes the best hamburger? Almost nobody, with the exception of kids, will say McDonald's. Sure, McDonald's has the most people go to it, and there are these blockbuster movies that are kind of trashy movies, maybe have the most people go watch them, but not most people will say they are the best. If you go to IMDb, you will see the best games as ranked by all the people who watch those games. If you go and find a great restaurant that's ranked really highly because people said it's ranked highly. And I'm talking to you guys. You guys like board games. You go walk, talk about board games. So we're not talking about what the mass market thinks anyway. We're not talking about what people think about Monopoly and Scrabble. We're talking about in these designer style board games. So when I say a game is great and a lot of people think that this game is great, I really mean that. Ticket to Ride, for example, a great game. Millions of people like this game and millions of people think it's great. You may think that it personally it's garbage and that's fine, that's completely your opinion. But it's a game that's great and loved by so many people, therefore it's going to be reprinted. Now, here's what happened on Board Game Geek was that someone made a geek list. Here's all the games that counteract Vassal's Law. And that's fine, again, remember, there's IP issues, and then there are copyright issues. Some games can't be reprinted for those things. Example, Dune or Star Wars Queen's Gambit. However, other games may already be in the works and you don't even know about it. I may not even know about it. So you gotta be careful about that too. But then there's the other category, and these are the games that are great to me and a few other people, but not great to everyone else. I call these cult classics. Here's an example of one that I like, and that is Duel of Ages. I think Duel of Ages is a really entertaining game. It has people uh, from all different time periods going and using weapons from all different time periods and going after each other. I find that sort of thing incredibly fascinating and entertaining and fun. However, I do realize that I am in a minority on that one. It's not highly ranked. There's a bunch of people who, like me, are extremely devoted fans of this. So when I talk about the game, I say that it's great. It's a great game, everyone's great. So I'm using, my problem is here is semantical because I'm using great for two different things. But it's not a game that I say is so great that I think it will be reprinted. It might be, but I don't think it, it's one of the ones that would meet the category of, of course, that will be reprinted at some point in time. There are other games that fit in this category too, of these cult classics. Really heavy war games that only a few people like. Really heavy Euro games. Many of the games in the 18XX series and games like that where there's a bunch of people. And I think sometimes people can't see the forest because of the trees because they're like, but I love it so much. It's amazing. Oh, these games are fascinating. Only, only more people knew about it. Well, guess what? Many of these games that you think are amazing and fantastic, again, that being completely fine. Love them being amazing and fantastic. 
would not do well if they were reprinted today, especially since in many of their cases, better games have come out that have replaced them and made them easier for people. And if people played the original one, they would think it was a step back. Now, you don't think it's a step back. You think this old first edition or these editions are way better than this modern stuff. But that's really just old man talk. Get off my lawn. It really is. So, again, I understand people have their favorite games. They want to see them be reprinted. And maybe they will someday. I'm just saying that if a game is truly great and is truly loved by many people and it's out of print and there's no IP problems and there's no copyright problems, it's going to get reprinted at some point or other. So don't worry about it. So don't worry when someone tells you, oh, you've never played Magic Realm? You've got to go find a copy of that. You don't. There's plenty of games. Go play Mage Knight. It's kind of the same feeling. <laughs> someone just had an aneurysm because it's not, it's not the same. But anyway, that's what I think about great games. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. I was really excited when Card Hunter hit the market because it looked like such a fun blend of RPG and dungeon crawler that used cards for combat and movement, and it had a sense of humor, but no app version. Well, Drop Forge has solved that with the release of Loot and Legends, which in spite of the name change, is the official port of Card Hunter to the app world. So let's take a quick look. Loot and Legends emulates a tabletop RPG pretty much on the nose. You level up as your party gains experience, and as the name suggests, there's a lot of loot to outfit your team with. Humor is used liberally, the graphics look great, and the controls have been optimized for a touch screen. But more than just a port, Dropforge clearly invested in refining Card Hunter with significant game changes like new character archetypes and redesigning the equipment system to optimize on rarity. Yeah, I said rarity because Loot and Legends is free to play and relies on people buying or winning treasure chests that have random equipment rewards. I'm not usually a fan of this model, but I didn't find it overly imposing in this game, and it's done better than it is in Card Hunter. There's this loot club that I think is way overpriced, but you can earn short passes through regular gameplay and and it isn't a must-have. The deck-building element is streamlined and fun because each piece of equipment has a different set of associated cards. There's a lot of powerful stuff to play around with, but I like the fact that not all decks are perfect for all scenarios. Early levels are actually really easy, but as you advance, crafting your deck for the pending battle specifics is necessary. Beyond the linear adventure track, there's also this arena that offers some significant rewards. You can play a free round every two hours or use in-game currency to play whenever you'd like. But both modes are against the AI because there's no multiplayer yet. I've read that this feature is in the works, which is great because facing off against a friend who's built up their own characters in a kind of tactical deck battle would be a ton of fun, and it's already available in Card Hunter. Loot and Legends is good looking, fun to play, and has a development group that's dedicated to porting content and features from Card Hunter, as well as creating new elements. And since it's free to play, it doesn't cost you anything to give Loot and Legends a try. Well, Internet, 2015 has been pretty good to us so far, especially in the mail department. Recently, something else showed up in the mail for me. And I mean for me. It was addressed directly to me. I felt so special. And the contents of the package were equally special. We received Say Cheese. Say Cheese is a game about making faces and having people try to decipher them. My favorite card, it's so hard to choose one. I mean, businessman farting in elevator is a classic, of course. But I think, I think the, the cops and robbers shootout with baguettes and bouquets of flowers instead of guns, this may be the winner for strangest picture in the game. Now, another weird thing about the game are the dice. I say dice because they say dice in the rules, but, they're not so much dice as they are long, flattened cardboard tubes. We love getting stuff in the mail, and I know you do too. So if you want to get something in the mail from us, what you need to do is follow us at Snakes and Lattes on Twitter and tweet using the hashtag Snakes and Lattes Mail Me Something Please. It's a long hashtag, I know, but do it. 
Hashtag snakes and lattes. Mail me something, please. All one word. And we will mail one randomly selected follower something from our prize vault. Say cheese. Well, folks, that's it for another board game breakfast. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you guys back here at 12, a, uh, 12 noon uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so we'll be answering some of your questions live there. And we got some other cool stuff that you'll be seeing this week. Folks, thanks so much again for watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much for all your emails. We always appreciate them. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.